in second line. So I'm sure most of you would have known uh, NUS has already a presence in second, second line for a few years. So what we really did this past semester, last semester, was something that is uh, a little different from what we have done so far. So um, maybe just before I start, I just like to mention what I'm going to cover today and what I'm not going to cover today. Because of time constraint, so what I'm really going to cover today is really a, a lot of demo on the immersive activities that's happening in Second Life for us. And what you can do to encourage and stimulate the critical thinking of the students and how we manage to engage the students in the virtual environment like Second Life. What we are not going to cover, which I did in the last show, uh, Buzzet previously, was how to use Second Life and using chat rooms in Second Life and how to overcome some of these te technical or logistical barriers in using Second Life for the students. So these are something that we are not going to cover today. So what I'm going to cover is what is happening on top here. Okay, so let me move on. Oops. Sorry. Okay, let me start off with a very important quote that is fresh out of the oven, I think, a few days ago, two days ago, I think. So this is um, one of the predictions in the Observer and Guardian. And I think as we can see, Second Life, as much as uh, with the recent amount of news that's going on about virtual environments like Second Life, I think what uh, Observer has uh, managed to, to really isolate is this very important aspect about Second Life, which is how much games and virtual environments like Second Life has become part of our life. And so much so that it is really becoming more and more closely connected to the reality of what we have today. So if you have time, just go and uh, take a look at this. So my, my point in, in putting this up is really to tell you that despite the recent news of what is happening to Linden Labs in USA, we as educators in Second Life are not really affected by this. Because so long as we pay our rent, you, you give us our land. Simple as that. So let's move away from all those news that's surrounding that and really concentrate and focus on what we're really good for here. Okay, Okay. more on to learning in Second Life and into virtual environments like this. I think Mayer has uh, said something very important, which I think is the shift of the paradigm of the educational perspective in, in our world today. So what really is happening is visual words are really what people are learning instead of just words alone itself. So I think um, we really need to change the mindset of what we have been learning in environments like this. And another aspect about Second Life is, uh, which is uh, also fresh out of the oven from this recent journal of Virtual Worlds and Education, which is released only a few days ago, which I managed to extract out, is I think a lot of people are comparing this with a lot of popular media like Facebook or Twitter, which is very different. I think what we have in Second Life is really involving a, a space where we have a shared activity instead of having a space where particular, particular activity occurs. So let's see how we can really use this for NUS and, and how we have done it so far for the past semester. Okay, I know this is really complicating, but this is really what we have done in the last semester for this module called NM3210, Cybercrime and Society. So what we have here is a four-tier scaffolding of activities that has happened inside Second Life for the students. And this is a cohort of 100 students, not just 20, not just 30 students. We are talking about a group of students that is huge. There's a split up in, I think, at least eight tutorial groups. So what we have here is uh, by breaking up into a scaffold of three or of four layers to ensure that the students perform some of these activities to ensure that they learn through these activities. I know um, now looking at this, it's, it looks very complicated. It doesn't make sense. But later on, when I go into the live demo inside here, you will understand better. Okay, so for the first objective, this is a cybercrime quest, meaning students are really learning what they can do to prevent cybercrimes or to learn about how cybercrimes evolve or how cybercrimes have been committed in our, our daily lives today as we speak. So what uh, this lesson was going on is in replacement of the lessons that has been happening in the week itself. And because this was e-learning week, so all the students that are involved are technically not in school. They could be in the comfort of their own homes, they could be in the hallways in the school, but they do not meet in class to do the tutorials for this. So does lectures. 
But I just like to re reiterate this: lectures in Second Life was not conducted in this module. Lectures were done over, I think, uh, Breeze. Basically, the, the lecturer uploaded her lectures as, as, as per normal, like how everybody is doing for the e-learning week. But the students were supposed to commit their time for the tutorials into the Second Life activity for this module. So basically, when they were first started, they were told they, they were supposed to perform these four activities to accomplish these uh, tutorial hours that are supposed to commit for the e-learning week itself. So firstly, they're supposed to locate this cipher device, which is a really an encryption device that uh, cyber hackers or cyber criminals have been using. And uh, after that, they're supposed to learn how to decrypt the cipher and, and possibly learn how the process of how this works. And after that, subsequently, to locate a surveillance cam, a camera that actually took a visual of the criminal. And after that, they're supposed to submit the answers of the name of the criminal so that they can ultimately finish this objective, which is catching this criminal. Okay, so this is really how the game is involved. And there's a little bit of role play involved into this virtual environment so that you can get the students to be as immersive as they can and they can feel for what they're doing and to really put meaning to what they're doing inside here in Second Life. Okay, don't worry about the details because I'm gonna show you live on the demo so that it makes more sense to you. Okay. So, as you can see, we are at this screen now. Can you close the note card first? Okay, so this is how the students will be approached. When they first sign up for their avatars, which is what we are going to do away with, basically the students, all 100 students of them, can come in at their own random time. So as what uh, I think Dr. Morgan has mentioned, really the students came in in the middle of the night. They don't do it in the day, they don't do it in the evenings, they do it in the middle of the night. So once all these students were coming in, they will be treated with these uh, two bots itself. Okay, don't care about what is happening on the left side because on the week itself, uh, School of Computing was having a, a, a module that's involving this as well, which is an interactive maze. So this is what you can see. But of, of course now the maze is already over. So I'm putting up only the cybercrime uh, bot itself. So the students were supposed to look at this bot. Can you zoom in on the bot, please? Okay, when you look at a bot, the instructions are very clear. They're supposed to be in fact, idiot proof to make sure that all the students, anyone who come in is supposed to know how to do it by looking at the visual itself. So the students are supposed to click on the bot and to get a startup kit. And so you, you'll be given to them. And when they open it, they're supposed to look at what the note will say. So on, they were supposed to click on the inventory and look at all this information that's given to them. So just to confirm that this is a module, they're supposed to go through all this uh, and give them the background information of what they're supposed to do and a summary version, a condensed version of what they're supposed to achieve at the end. So after that, they're supposed to teleport using one of the links to this first location they're supposed to start. Okay, can you teleport there? Okay, so while he's teleporting, can you just look at the screen itself? So um, these are just a group of the students who came in as a group. So the simulation for this location of the cipher device was actually in the Bronx. Uh, it's in New York City in the Bronx, so we are supposed to uh, basically go to this uh, criminal site and look for this cipher device that the, the police were looking for. So um, the reason why we are really using this activity to get the students started is because through these activities, I really hope that the students can get orientated in using Second Life first. We all know that Second Life has a steep learning curve. So the way that we design this uh, activity is really just to get them orientated in using Second Life. So by, by overcoming the first uh, round of activities, they should be able to use Second Life enough to go to the second level so that they can go into more in-depth activities. So these are just some of the students going in the house looking for the item itself. So as you can see on the left, this is the live version. So wherever they teleport, I made sure that there are instructions for them because in a virtual environment like Second Life, anyone can get lost and everyone will get lost. So when you click on this, it will give you the next set of information to tell you what you're supposed to do for task one. So they will tell you that, oh, you need to look for the cipher device and that's what you have to do. And they will be, uh, they will be telling them that you need to enter the house, you need to look for the cipher device and other. Okay, so you can go look for the device. Okay, so while she's traveling to the, to the, to the device location, which is a two-story house, so they just need to go through the rooms and look for the cipher device. So 
there are actually decoys around as well. Okay, this was the part where I tell you the students have a love-hate relationship with me inside here. Because they told me they love this because it's challenging, but they also hate me because they couldn't find it. So I have to make it uh, challenging in a sense because I need to engage them in this experience. So a lot of the students were treated with a lot of the decoys at first. But eventually, what they really found was the one on the bed. There is, if you click on, if you click on any of the decoys, they will tell you that this is not supposed to this is not the device that you're supposed to look for. So after that, they will go upstairs to the actual location where there's only one device that will give them the cipher device, okay? So once you get that device, another set of information will be given to you to tell you how you should progress to the next one, okay? On the bit, this on the bit, yeah. Yes, so as you can see, through this exercise, the students will be able to learn how to use second life. So this is my point of, of, of making sure that the students will nail the learning curve when they first enter into second life. Because um, I have to assume that the, some of the students, when they enter this environment itself, they will not have prior information into second life. They will do not have any prior training, no experience with this. So I was hoping that this early part of the experience can first engage them, and at the same time, can also learn, let them learn how to use second life. Okay, so. When you click on the second set of information, you'll be able to teleport to this uh, location called the Cybercrime Lab. So this is the neat part about us because this is a, uh, uh, all these places are, are not uh, revealed to the outside public and only students who are participating in this game will be able to come inside here. So like I said, when you come in here, you'll be able to see the second set of instructions for you for task two. So by the time the students reach this area, they will be able to, to get a sense of accomplishment of how much they have achieved here. So, okay, so can you just go upstairs first? Yeah. So after receiving the instructions, they're supposed to go. So while we are going upstairs, I would like you to look at these objective number one first. So what I really hope to achieve is to achieve the discovery learning in the aspect of second life. So what, what we have here is uh, there's always the good, the bad. So I'm not, I'm not afraid to expose this as well. So the good is we really encourage the motivation and active engagement inside Second Life. And as a student, they learn how to be independent and responsible for what they are doing inside this environment as well. And uh, because of the environment itself, they learn how to look at different creative ways in solving the issues inside here. So there's a lot of problem-based simulation inside here that they are first treated and introduced to. So, and very much this is a tailored learning experience for them. But of course, there's a bad side to this. Because for students who have never been to Second Life, they will be given, I mean, they will be uh, basically overwhelmed. And there's a cognitive overload. There's too much things going on. There's a lot of things going to, to, to get them to learn. And I think what we really hope in, in easing off this is to let them enjoy this experience, enjoy the challenges in this game. Okay, so, and, um, but also because of this, they develop misconceptions about what they're doing inside there. So hopefully, we can have all these advantages that can outweigh this. Then I think uh, what is also difficult is in this virtual environment, it is difficult for us to detect some of these areas. So what we, we try to do is we try to be as present as possible in, in, in the virtual environment with them so that we can find out if they are feeling okay, if they're doing okay, okay? So let me move on to this. Okay, this is, um, uh, you can play the video and try. Okay, the, one of the task instructions that they're supposed to do is uh, to decrypt the cipher that they have already uh, found in the previous uh, task. So this, okay, this video that's playing itself is streaming directly from Second Life. So uh, they don't need to really go out of Second Life to do this. So while looking at this video, this video will actually teach them how to, how to decrypt what they have received from the cipher device. And um, I think this is something that um, it's important for them to learn because right after this, they're going to be immediately trying to decrypt what they have found in the cyber device. Okay, so, okay, can we can, can move on to the cyber device, the decoder. Okay, so this is the, the lab itself. And in the previous instructions, they're supposed to wear, uh, can you zoom in on the device itself? Yeah, just turn, on, turn off the AO yeah, and zoom in on device. Okay, 
Okay, uh, what she's doing is she's zooming in on the device and it, it could look like any thumb drive that you can see in the real life. So what she needs to do is to really take up this device and to go and decrypt it using the reader. So she's approaching the reader now. And by a touch of it, you can see they actually process what has been touched. And what it's going to give them is they're going to give it some gibberish code which is supposed to be for her to decrypt. So in the video earlier, he has already taught them how they can decrypt this. Okay, so this is the gibberish code. So the students will take down this code, and what they need to do now is to turn to their left and look at this ROT13 decryption code book. So from here, I'm gonna show you this. So this is the, the device that they were supposed to look at and they're supposed to touch, and they're supposed to decrypt the message that is within. And the message is, let's meet at this Rich Cat Cafe. So the students will be very overwhelmed at this time because they have accomplished a lot by the time they've come here. So they, they'll be very happy and chirpy and they'll be going, so where do we go next? So the next clue they're supposed to find is actually at this. Because uh, when they, uh, upon entering this lab itself, I think the more observer ones will probably notice that this is actually a landmark that will bring you to the next location. So some of the students will be trying to find this, this location. So eventually, when they come down, they will find this link and they will basically teleport themselves to the next location, which is what she's doing now. Okay, so while this, this uh, environment is loading, just turn around and load the instruction part. Okay, so what we have done here is uh, the experiential learning in, in this. This is a very transform transformative learning exercise that we have done there is nothing compared to what you do in a daily classroom environment that you have. So what we have here is to do, to observe, to think, and to plan in this sequence. So what we have done there is to teach them how to decipher, how to, how to get this, the, the codes out of the, the, the cipher itself, how to decrypt it, and to be able to derive a message from it. So what it does is it, it promotes a lot of assimilation of what and how it works, and to be able to apply it and to get a hands-on exercise immediately and to observe this and to collect this new information immediately. But of course, there's a bad side to this. It proves to be too challenging for some, especially the new people. So what really works around here is, uh, once you see people around in Second Life, and you, you start asking, how do I do this, how do I do that? You start to learn from your peers as well in Second Life. So as much as some of them could be there for maybe a few, a few other minutes, when, when the next person comes in and you, they find out how they do it, they will possibly progress together in this game itself. So I'm not that worried about this. But um, there's also the fact that the procedural instructions may not help learning. Because we all know that learning really works sometimes because the students construct their own knowledge. So uh, some of these steps that we have here are very, very detailed and very structured in that way. So what we, really what we really worry is it might hinder the actual learning process. Okay? And of course, there's the same cognitive overload because uh, by the time of the activity, the students could be tired out by the amount of things that they've been introduced at this time. Okay? But we have uh, told the students that if at any time that they couldn't finish or they, they felt tired by this, they should just lock off and come back to it because when you log in again, you will be at the last location that you're at. So technically, you can come back and redo this. Okay? So, Let's move on. So now this is the, the cafe that they're supposed to go to. So as usual, there's a lot of um, role play instructions will tell them that what they're supposed to find here. So by clicking on the instructions, they're supposed to go into this place. First, to locate a surveillance camera that has captured the criminal's visual. Okay, so they're supposed to find out this, this criminal that they're supposed to track. And at the same time, they're supposed to watch another video on the screen here. And this video is very important because this video has nothing to do with the game, nothing to do with anything that we have here, but it is a, cam uh, it is a video that is related to what they're doing here. As you can see, there's a lot of surveillance cameras here, in fact, too many cameras, which is what is happening in some countries. So what is critical in the discussion here that the lecturer wants them to do is to watch this video about surveillance cameras in the United Kingdom. As we all know, there's uh, overabundance of uh, cameras in, in surveillance cameras in, in UK so much so that it actually it actually uh, invades into privacy and stuff like this. So one of the critical discussions that the lecturers wish that the students can really talk about is 
um, maybe uh, is too much surveillance good or is too much surveillance bad for your privacy? So the, at the end of this exercise, they're supposed to submit a reflection paper based on what they've seen in this video associated to what they are doing here. Okay, so uh, basically uh, back to the first task that they're supposed to do here, which is really to click on these cameras to find out which camera has captured the visual. So you, if you click on any one of them, they will tell you whether is it correct. So this is not the correct one. So the correct one is actually the one behind the avatar itself. So if you click on this, it will give you something, which is criminal caught on camera. So upon getting this, um, you shall open up the note card, which will give you the instructions to the next one. And at the same time, to give you the visual, can you click on the visual? Okay, we'll give you the visual of the criminal that they're supposed to track. Okay, I know this sounds a little weird. Why are we looking at criminal spaces here? Okay, the reason is because you're supposed to bring this criminal back to the lab where there is a police lineup and you're supposed to match this visual to the criminal lineup there. So now let's go back to the lab itself. All these links are provided in the instructions that are given to them. Okay. So um, while this is resing, I'm, I'm just going to go to the next one. So this is the, the visual that they will see. So this is a police lineup and they're supposed to match it. And I made it a little challenging for them. So I made two criminals that look almost the same. So you can see like 20 to 30% of the students made the same mistake of finding the first person that they saw with the moustache. So the truth is, the criminal that was supposed to be found is supposed to be the one who is involved in a phishing scam because this is cybercrime and this is a narcotics abuser, so no. And the fact that uh, there's a lot of uh, other small little details that they should be looking out for, okay? So this is the live version. So you're looking at the wall, they can zoom in on the wall to look at this. Okay, so now, after this, the students are supposed to submit their answers inside Second Life. I'm not taking this whole application out of Second Life. We are still in Second Life, and the students are supposed to be graded for this participation that they have. So they're supposed to submit their answers inside Second Life. So uh, she will show you how it's supposed to be done. So very simple, they just need to type it into the chat channel, and this device here will capture their answers which will match it to their matrix numbers and their avatar names inside Second Life. And at the end of this exercise, all I need to do is come in to churn out the whole list, submit to the lecturer, and to be used for grading. Okay, so I think this will take around 3% of the actual uh, weightage of this, while the others are actually given to the reflection paper they're supposed to do for the video that they've watched inside Second Life. And all these are happening inside the e-learning week. Okay. So what, uh, as you can see, if you enter the wrong characters or anything, they will, or you enter the wrong matrix numbers, they also tell you that it's wrong and it's all checked. So no student should go wrong when it comes to some of these. Okay, let me just move on, I'm running short of time. Okay, so this is the last one that I was talking about. So the submission of the reflection paper is, the, is in, in essentially the one of the most important because this is the part where the students can construct their own knowledge and to be able to reflect it on the paper and to be submitted to show how much they have learned from this process. So um, the good part about this is, uh, of course, uh, you can internalize this knowledge into a critical thinking. And of course, uh, to be active and independent in the logic formation of this. And basically, this is also the only way the lecturer can have a two-way communication with what the students have learned inside Second Life. And last but not least, the students whatever they have written in the reflection paper could be brought into the real life classroom where the, where the teachers can actually address some of the problems that they have seen. Okay, so the bad is of course, there's obviously sometimes where you see social interaction missing from this constructivism of the knowledge here. And because of this, the, we could also have a failure to correct some of these misconceptions that they have. Okay. So as you can see, one of, I think uh, one of Vygotsky's uh, theory about learning is about social constructivism. And I think it says a lot in some of these pictures that we see. Because when the students group together, you can see the amount of interaction and the amount of learning that they achieve could be doubled or even multiple. So what you can see here is the students, when they group together, they tend to share a lot of some of this knowledge that they've learned from the process or some of the researches that they've done inside. Okay, so let me move on to the last one. Okay, before we look at this graph, I just want to show you what uh, 
what has really gen been generated at the end of this module. So if you look at this side, uh, can you click on this? If you look at this uh, cybercrime society, this is actually a gallery of some of the research findings of the students that have been done inside this module. So if you teleport yourself to this link, you'll be treated to this gallery of all the research findings for the module itself that the students have found. So if you go inside, you can see the students have uh, uh, basically been uh, separated into different tutorial groups, and they're all doing different areas of research here. But as you can, as you can see, in tutorial groups, right, there's a limit to how many students can be in that group. So students between tutorial groups do not talk. But what we have here is because of this contiguous place that we have, the students can now look at some of the other work and researchers that the students have found out in the other tutorial groups. And all these are put into this gallery where the students can come in and have a look. So during exam time, we can have students coming from other tutorial groups trying to find out what the other students are, 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 are researching because uh, they told me that some of the NGOs, I do not know who they are, and, but the other groups have researched on, and I thought it would be a good time to come and extract what they have learned. So this is a, a, a good place for us to share some of these uh, learnings and research that they have done. Okay, so that's all for the live part about Second Life that I'm going to show. So we also did a user survey at the end of the quest itself for the e-learning week itself. I think to isolate some of the more important aspects about this is the students were all in favor of the fact that they could be doing this together with their friends and it could be more fun and it definitely enhanced what they have learned. So I think the element of fun basically is the critical factor that really enhance what they have learned inside Second Life. And because of this, they can also relate to the concepts, concepts that they have learned inside Second Life, which is very much in tune with what they can see in real life. And that should be all that I'm showing for the conclusion <laughs> part. I hope I have enough time for one or two questions. If there's no questions, you can email me at this. Yes. <laughs> 